I'm very pleased to uh, introduce the speaker. Dr. Smoky Musai is an assistant professor of anthropology here at Ohio University. Uh, prior to arriving here, she was a postdoctoral scholar at the Institute for Money, Technology, and Financial Inclusion at the University of California, Irvine. She has her PhD in anthropology from uh, the New School for Social Research. She's a cultural anthropologist who specializes in economic and legal anthropology. And her research interests include anthropology of money and value, informal and alternative economies, speculative bubbles, corruption and the rule of law, post-socialist transformations, and societies of Southeast Europe and the Mediterranean. Uh, she's very well published. And uh, she has a edited volume uh, coming out uh, next year entitled Money at the Margins, Global Perspectives on Technology, Inclusion, and Design. Uh, and this, uh, w what she will talk to us today, represents her current research project. Um, so I'll let her introduce that to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for coming here in this afternoon. Uh, as I'm talking, I'm going to pass this book around which has different photos of Albania, and I've marked this section with the two po yellow post-it notes that has a lot of photos of construction um, in Albania and different kinds of construction, rural, urban, and so on. So just because I'm going to talk about construction and buildings, so I'm going to just start, you can just kind of browse through it. So um, um, what I'm presenting today is um, a, a project that I actually began researching since I started here at OU in 2014. So this is a work in progress. And um, I'm mostly going to kind of open, kind of outline some of my findings and some of the preliminary conclusions um, that I've made so far. But I, I would really appreciate questions and suggestions for moving forward. Uh, so my research focuses on construction and speculation in Albania. And for some, for just to kind of situate Albania on the map, a lot of my students from the Mediterranean class are here, and they've heard so much about Albania and how important it is in the world <laughs> history. <laughs> so they get to hear a little, a little bit more of that today. So Albania um, is in the Balkans and uh, borders the Adriatic and the Ionian Sea. Um, it is a country that um, has always been kind of at the margins of various empires and um, political systems and economy. Um, it, it was one of the countries of the socialist bloc that during the Cold War that had one of the most kind of authoritarian forms of communism, very centralized economy, um, one leader th throughout the, the 45 years. Uh, and, the, and in the 90s, because of that very kind of austere kind of communism, in the 90s, Albania uh, embraced the post-socialist reform and market reforms uh, vigorously. Um, this is kind of the kind of geographic map, the physical map. And the, my research on, um, on the construction, which is the new research, focuses primarily on the cities of Tirana, which is the capital, Vlora and Saranda, which are kind of two coastal towns. And all three of these towns have undergone um, rapid growth since uh, the 90s, uh, there's been a, a huge rural to urban migration just as, as, as has been in other post-socialist countries. Today I will mostly talk about Tirana just because for lack of time, but um, some of the, inter some of the uh, I'll make some references to Vlora too because there are of, of course some differences as well because these cities are on the water and they have more like a tourist uh, economy. But Tirana is the capital, is also the place where I grew up. And so I really love it, but I love it not in kind of a romantic way, but more on this kind of like melancholy way, because it's one of the cities that um, has a lot of cool things going on, but it's also uh, has a lot of poverty and a lot of like lack of infrastructure. What I will do today is I will focus on three, uh, as I'm looking at this um, new phenomenon of, of construction boom in, in Tirana since the 2000s in particular, I want to highlight three parts. First, I want to talk a little bit about the economics of construction boom. And I want to highlight this one phenomenon that is very particular to the Albanian um, construction boom, and which is called clearing. And it's a, it's a so, sort of barter um, exchange that developers and subcontractors have used as a way to finance construction. And, and I want to contrast that to financialization, which is the phenomenon that we're most familiar with 
um, in, in similar booms in other parts of the world. Um, or hyperbuilding, another form of um, uh, financing of buildings in kind of big mega cities, especially in Asian cities. So this one, what I'm saying is that the Tirana case is actually different, although there is a similar pattern of uh, speculation in construction. The second point, or the second topic I want to discuss is the politics and legal framing of construction. And this is where I'll talk a little bit about uh, allegations of corruption, uh, both on the local level and federal and uh, central level. And then finally, I want to turn to critiques of construction and corruption by people on the ground. And I'll look in particular at the idiom of betonism, uh, which comes from the word beton, which means concrete. So people are uh, kind of criticizing corruption, uh, construction and corruption in construction by targeting the concrete, the, the kind of proliferation of concrete in urban space. So just let me just give uh, a little bit kind of a broad overview of this construction boom um, in Albania. So the, the boom started especially in, two, in around the year 2000s, um, and it concentrated primarily in the capital of Tirana, but also in some of the towns that I showed earlier that are on the coast. And so it, it had to do with this urban, uh, rural urban migration to these cities. Um, just to give you some of the data, it, by 2006, Construction as a kind of economic sphere counted for 12.9% of the GDP. Um, and then in 2010, which was the peak of this boom, uh, it was close to 20% of the GDP. So uh, the, the, my focus on construction um, is also on how construction plays a role in the economy of the country, both in terms of GDP. The other thing that came out through my interviews is also how construction is a source of employment for a lot of people. It kind of fell down by 2014, and I'll talk a little bit about this, there was a moratorium on construction licensing, uh, but it has began to grow again. So the last couple of years, there's a lot of uh, newspaper coverage of this new construction boom. This year, um, the, the kind of the Bank of Albania data showed that the economy has grown by 4%, and half of that growth is due to a growth in construction. Um, now, construction in Albania consists of different kinds of construction. So the, the most kind of the thing that is most obvious is the construction of housing. So uh, during communism, Albania had a very strict um, kind of housing regime whereby uh, everything was public housing. There's no private housing. And there was more of a push for people to kind of get new housing in housing developments that were built by the state. And on one hand, uh, the communist state guaranteed the right to housing, right? So everyone had the right to housing, and the state was supposed to be responsible for providing housing. But as Albania started to experience economic uh, downturn after the 80s, when it broke ties with China, it, um, it slowed down significantly the building of new homes. So in the 90s, when there was this transition period, uh, there was a huge housing shortage. Uh, and in addition to the fact that people wanted to move to different places, there was just, they, they also lived in very small apartments. Um, so basically there was a, a across the board desire for new homes. And so the first boom kind of came at this time when there was this really high um, demand for housing. Um, and so this is, for instance, one area in Tirana that is all built since the late 1990s. Uh, I'll show you in the Tirana map. And you can see that there's various layers of construction. Construction is still going on. Now, what you probably can't see or would, wouldn't know by looking at this picture for the first time is that a lot of these apartment buildings are now actually, there's a lot of vacancy, right? So, so that basically, by the time that I started researching this topic more, more carefully, um, there, ha there has been a saturation of the market um, in terms of ha housing. And so a lot of this uh, construction was half way through because there was no more sales. I'll explain a little bit more about this. Now, in addition to housing, there's also been a lot of kind of investment in building infrastructure, building roads in particular. Um, and then um, on top of that, there's a lot of self-built housing. So people, some of the photos in that book that is circulating is from people building up their own houses. And the financing for that usually comes from remittances, um, the remittance economy. Now, um, so this kind of, this graph shows the, the growth and, and slowdown of construction from 1996 
to 2015. The, the, the peak of it was around years 2000, but construction continued. Um, there was a kind of a slowdown around 2000 to 2014 that had to do with the uh, moratorium that I'll talk about later. And then there is, a, again, um, construction is on the rising again. So one of the questions that I ask when I'm doing my research is, um, how is this construction boom financed? Um, now the kind of the two main sources of finance in which we're familiar with is um, bank credit, right? So there is, and so I mentioned the term financialization earlier. Uh, so there's definitely, um, it, since the 90s, uh, credit has been extended to both kind of individual consumers or home buyers as well as developers or uh, uh, businesses. So credit, the credit economy didn't exist in Albania before the 90s, right? So, so there's definitely that is, phenomenon has been going on. Um, another source of financing is through public works. And this also, public works are also financed through uh, loans, but these are more international loans that government gets, for instance, to build a road, right? Uh, so this is kind of, uh, these two sources of finances, you find them expanding in other parts of the world as well. But the, the third, kind of source of financing that, and this is what I look at more, more um, carefully, clearing, is something that is very unique to the context of Albania. Uh, so clearing is a term, local term that people use to refer to this specific kind of transaction between developers and subcontractors, which is a sort of barter exchange. So instead of paying, so you know, a developer is gonna build a building and it's gonna hire uh, subcontractors to do like the tiling, the plumbing, uh, you know, the windows or whatever. Instead of paying them in cash or in credit, they pay them in future apartments or in a, other apartments that they have. Okay, so now what that means is that um, the subcontractor who will all, also has employees will not ca have cash in hand to pay their employees, but they have to sell that apartment, right, it, when the apartment is built, um, cash it out, and then pay the employees. Now that scheme works as long as there is, you know, there is sales, um, but it stops working when um, you know, the subcontractors are not able to sell their apartments anymore. So, by two, so this kind of worked in the early 2000s, but by 2010, um, economists and journalists that were following this um, the sector, because it was one of the most growing sectors in the economy, they started to talk about a crisis of liquidity in the construction uh, sector and the chains of debt between all these different players, right? The developers and subcontractors and, and, and workers. Um, and so there was a lot of talk about this in 2009, 2010, which drew my attention at the time because there was a lot of comparisons between this crisis of liquidity and the pyramid schemes that I had studied earlier. Um, and then I also noticed as I started to doing kind of field work on the ground that similar um, comparisons um, are being made again starting off with last year. And this has to do with kind of an increase in, again, in um, these forms of exchanges, kind of informal forms of credit and debt. Now, um, so let me just talk a little bit more about clearing and how it works and kind of what are some of the consequences on the ground. So this is a building, it looks like it's in construction. It looks, it's looked like this for like six years. Um, and basically what you see is that it's partly finished, but then the top floors are obviously not finished yet. But you, perhaps you can see from the distance, but if you look closely, um, you have like AC units and clothes hanging on the balconies, which means that people have actually moved in to the finished apartments, even though you know this shouldn't be legal because the building has to be completed first before people moving in. But basically it kind of shows you how clearing apartments work. Um, so the developer or subcontractor will sell these apartments and then use that cash to continue to rebuild rather than taking a loan from a bank for instance. Um, and so on one hand, one side of this scheme or, or this form of financing um, avoids some of the risks that are associated with bank debt, right? So that if, if they're, you know, you can't pay then you know, you're just waiting until you're selling your apartment rather than having to pay interest to the bank for your loan. But on the other hand, the negative consequences of this scheme are that it, it is, is a, what I call it's 
a sort of redistribution of risk. Um, so for one thing, and this is actually these are uh, ideas that I got from the field, from from people who were part of the um, uh, construction industry, not the high level uh, developers, but either mid level or subcontracting firms who uh, lamented that basically by doing clearing, by engaging in clearing, these major developers are basically trying to push the risk of sales onto the subcontractors. And then the subcontractors are pushing it onto the workers. So for instance, I interviewed an, a worker in one of the cities that had worked in construction, and he hadn't been paid for his job for two years. Um, and he didn't, still didn't know where, when he was going to be paid. And he would still go and work for the, the subcontracting firms on clearing because he would rather be at work than be out of work altogether. Um, another the kind of negative consequence of clearing is that, at least from what the subcontractors say, is that it pushes the firms to do a, a less quality job in their construction. So one of the, uh, an, an appraiser that I uh, interviewed at length um, described how this process works. So I'm going to only read like the, the bolded part. So he says the clearing firm is, full, is, so, is forced to sell the apartment at a lower rate um, than the developer say at 500 euros per square meter in order to generate liquidity for itself. But how is the subcontractor then going to make up for the difference in price? He will buy lower quality materials. He will not use the 7 euro per square meter tiles, but, but the 4.5 euro per uh, square meter tiles, and so on. It is a domino effect. So across the board, a lot of the people who are um, in this industry and who are aware of clearing um, they uh, agreed, or, or they, they kind of they had this idea that the buildings that were built on clearing are less qual uh, lower quality buildings, right? And so um, the other um, kind of uh, layer of risk that these buildings are reproducing, in addition to economic risk for the builders and, and subcontractors, is the risks of the actual quality of the building, environment, and then. Um, other things as well. A lot of the buildings, as I'll talk in a bit, are in areas that lack infrastructure and lack kind of more other general uh, goods that you expect um, in, in a new development. So um, when asked further about, okay, well, how is this reproduced, you know, and why does it still continue, um, a lot of the people then turned on to the, talking about uh, corruption and, and the politics around assigning construction permits. Um, so, um, this is a map of Tirana that shows its growth over time. It's by an urban planning institute, and they, the, the kind of the darker areas is where the oldest the people that have lived there, the oldest from 1937, and it kind of shows you how the city has grown. Um, so, in 2007, like the, the wider yellowish areas is, is kind of the newer um, uh, residents that have joined the city. Now, the, the couple of neighborhoods that I visited that have this clearing apartments are, um, one is here is Fresco, and the other one here is Kashar. And at the time that the construction boom was happening, these this, uh, areas were actually not part of the um, city limits, the official city limits, but they were part of these little counties. And those counties, uh, people would say, the politicians didn't have any other sources of revenue, and granting construction licenses was a, a source of private wealth for them, right? So then there was this big boom in construction licenses in, in these outer areas, um, precisely because for those uh, officials, that was the only way that they could get some kind of additional wealth. So that kind of points to the, the, the politics of, cons of granting um, uh, licenses and how construction and construction licenses have become this prime kind of object of corruption, object of uh, wealth, and object of power. And so this, they have become a major uh, topic of conversation in um, many of the elections that I followed. Now, walking through those cities, I'm going to show some photos from that. Um, you, you really have a sense of kind of lacking infrastructure, incomplete buildings. Here is another one where you see there's one and two apartments that are lived in, but the rest of the building is actually incomplete. Um, some of the buildings, all of the constructions in Albania, they have to have this kind of information sheet that tells you when they got the license and when the building is supposed to finish. And a lot of them, 
this was, photo was taken in 2015, and that sign says that the building should have been completed in 2013. So, you know, you get the sense of, you know, the, the how um, a, a lot of the licenses that were given were basically given to developers who did not have, who did not show that they had all the cash up front, right? That they did not um, have the means of completing that project. Um, at, at the same time, as some of these kind of new buildings are still being sold, you have kind of new ongoing construction, right? So that speaks once again to the politics of uh, construction licenses. Um, now, so let me talk a little bit about permits and politics. One thing that I want to, as I'm doing this research, this is the part where I actually have a hard time deciding where to stand. Um, because it is not actually a very kind of clear cut black and white situation where you know all these politicians are the bad guys and they are the ones who are corrupt and if you just took this out them out you would kind of solve this whole problem um, the in reality what I found out kind of from my research so far is that actually a lot of um, um, sorry, I skipped a lot of this material that, that a lot of the, that sometimes it's not clear whether, you know, the way that this different politicians are, um, or different administrators are granting um, these licenses, it's corrupt or not. But what is become more and more the norm is that there is always accusations of corruption whenever there's a new construction project uh, or a new construction permit. Um, so the, even the issuing of permits itself became an, an, a political, a very highly politicized issue. So this kind of gives you, this graph gives you a sense of issues, uh, uh, permits that were issued from 95 to the present, and you see there's the, that initial boom, and then there's kind of up and down. Um, and in the last few years, between 2012, 2015, there was really low uh, issuing of construction permits. And on one hand, so this is when I also started looking at, at this subject, right? So I was expecting people to be happy about this moratorium on construction licenses. But then I realized that actually people were not happy, or people actually read that as a political move. This was a time when um, um, there was a different, so the, the party in power on the federal level um, was different than the, than the one at the city level. So then what they were doing was they were trying to stop each other from giving the permits to the companies that they are more tied to. Um, I want to see if I have some time to play this video. I do. Okay, so this is Eddie Rama, who is currently the Prime Minister of Albania. And, and he is a really cool guy. He was a painter by training and a rebel and kind of very eccentric as a personality. And he was first mayor in Tirana between 2000 and 2011. I'm going to go back. Although this is, the, this is kind of like a national chart, um, Tirana is the primary driver of construction, so it de definitely falls on Tirana. But I just want to point out, so he was mayor from 2000 to 2011, so this is when a lot of construction licenses were issued. Uh, so just to keep that in mind. Now, Edi Rama is well known uh, nation, uh, internationally, globally, for this project that he did, which is he repainted communist buildings uh, that were kind of gray, dilapidating, um, with this beautiful colors and, and, and very kind of, uh, again, eccentric designs. And so he won an award in 2004 for best mayor in the world. Um, and he has a TEDx talk if you want to see it. And he is even featured in this song that I'm going to play because we do have time. And this is kind of like, you know, the Jay-Z and Alicia Keys song, Empire State of Mind? Okay, so this is like the Tirana version of that. And it really, I think Jay-Z and Alicia Keys actually um, stole the idea from West Side Family, which is an Albanian kind of hip hop group, because it has similar lyrics. It's about the city as the jungle, full of paradoxes, and where you can make it there, you make it anywhere. Oh no, no. There is no internet server? Are you kidding me? Okay, just give me one second. How do I? See if it, see if it connects. Okay. Well, it's okay if it doesn't, but no, it's not it will be great. To the internet. Uh, 
Okay, that's okay. Okay. Well, it's fine. That will be something for you to <laughs> research. And I can't believe that how is it not, con how is like the whole school is connected? Can you do a wireless? How do I do that? <laughs> no, it doesn't have a wireless. Oh, you unplug it? I'm in. Let's plug this. No, no plug. He says, he says unplug it. Unplug it? Unplug the what? This one? Um, you know what? It's okay. We'll, it will be, remain a mystery. You will uh, look this up. It's called West Side Family, Tirona. Like Tirana, but Tirona is the way people say sing it. But anyway, so th there is a song, and it's all about you know the. It came out again in the 2000s, and it's all about the the city and the paradoxes of the city and the pleasures and the frustration, the corruption. And then Edirama features in that uh, again, also talking about like noise, noise, a lot of noise, a lot of noise. And he does like he's trying to be the cool guy. But anyway, so and and he also you know they. they feature the colors of the city, which is kind of his signature um, as, as a mayor. But one of the other sides of the story is that a lot of people also complain about him uh, using construction licensing um, as a way to gain more political clout with different elites um, in the city. Um, so, okay, so he then uh, became prime minister uh, since 2013, and following him, um, in 2015, so there was a, the, so there, the, these guys are both from the Socialist Party, which is more like center left, um, and the opposition party is Democratic Party. Although both of them really follow very similar um, uh, policies when it comes to economic policies, very neoliberal policies. So the new mayor, Arion Velia, also came in um, with the slogan of, you know, the, the right direction for Tirana. Um, and he was part of the alliance for the European Albania, and and a lot of the a lot of the mayors, the, the, at least these two mayors, they really try to um, uh, portray this vision of the city of Tirana as a European city, and that this plays a really important role in kind of the imaginaries of the city. Uh, Velia also came from a non-traditional uh, background. He came from the NGO, the civil society. And he was also really um, kind of promoting himself as someone who is not going to be corrupt and who is not going to grant clientelistic contracts. At the same time, and I voted for this guy, so I really like him. So I'm, but at the same time, I'm conflicted because throughout, you know, even as he's become mayor, um, the accusations or laments about corruption in construction in particular um, have continued. Um, one. Last year, for instance, there were a lot of protests around the uh, building of this new uh, playground in the only kind of green space of the city, which is this park. Uh, and, and a lot of the, the protests targeted betonism, right? So the term that I've been using, uh, wh which comes from the term concrete. So they were, they were kind of um, criticizing the, the mayor's office, the city hall for pouring concrete into this green space. So laments about cons corruption continue. And they're especially focused now more, not so much on the, uh, the peripheral buildings that I showed earlier, but on the public works, such as this, uh, the park. Uh, and part of it has to do with the way in which, again, um, the cities, uh, city uh, governments, like the ones in Tirana, more and more rely on kind of international funding for uh, financing some of their own work. So it becomes so those contracts, the public procurement contracts, become uh, kind of a important site where corruption can take place. The other, uh, th so anyway, so when I'm looking at these critiques of corruption in construction, I am paying attention at the language that people are using. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, the, the Betonism is the, the kind of symbol of the con con corruption in construction. And so I, I'm trying to think about you know, why the material of concrete becomes this idiom of critique of corruption in construction. So I want us to kind of you know, 
get local about this, right? So what does concrete, the material of concrete, bring to mind uh, in Albania? Now, one of the things that concrete has had all these different symbolisms in um, kind of national imaginary. During communism, concrete was considered as the material of modernity across the socialist space. Um, this, is a, this is an old socialist concrete panel apartment building. So all the, this was uh, considered as an architectural um, uh, delight uh, because it, was, it solved the issue of housing in uh, all these uh, former socialist countries. And, and it was also aesthetically considered as, you know, again, associated with modernity. In contemporary architecture in Albania too, I, I'm actually surprised about this because for some of the people on the ground, the concrete reminds them of these now dilapidated um, apartment buildings, right? This um, housing projects. But still, new, develop, uh, new design firms and architecture firms like this fr uh, Belgian firm that built this tower right at the center of Tirana are still kind of um, projecting this image of concrete as the material of the future, as the material of progress and uh, Europeanness. Um, at the same time, for people on the ground, concrete has become a symbol of um, kind of the negative sides of, of the construction boom. So I first heard about this betonism as a pejorative term when I was doing research in Vlora, which is a, a city in the coast. And everyone pointed to me at this uh, new developments that were along the coast or along the uh, boardwalk um, for, that used to be all olive groves, like the top part of this photo, but now it's all uh, betonism, right? It's all buildings in concrete. And so for the people of Vlora who have this image of Laura as a beautiful city in the Mediterranean, um, the betonism of this, this area had kind of multiple negatives. One was an, a, a kind of environmental negative. Like for them, uh, they're worried that all this construction is actually destroying the green space of the city. Second, it's, um, you know, and this is part of the theme of my kind of ongoing research, is that there is a, there is a connection that people make between construction and corruption. So every time there are new constructions, construction projects, there is a suspicion that some corrupt dealing has taken place. Um, and finally, there is this kind of aesthetic dimension of these claims, of these critiques of the concrete. Uh, for people in Vlora, they, they, they want to, again, they, they have this idea of the city as the natural city sitting on the coast of the Mediterranean. And so there is a certain, the concrete buildings are an eyesore. Um, the a more recent, so I mentioned the, the building of the park. The, the, so this is the opening of the park. And it is actually, as a mother who has gone with my child to Albania every year, this is the best park mm -hmm. that exists in, in, in Albania. Everything else is plastic, uh, you know, really bad materials. This is the only one that's actually using, I mean, you, you, here you see the concrete, but other structures have all of, you know, other structures that are more durable and they're more fun, more creative, right? So that's why I'm saying that I'm conflicted because on one hand I said, okay, finally there is a nice playground for kids. But um, the people that are protesting it are not protesting just because it's a playground and just because it's made out of concrete, but because by pouring concrete in this space, the mayor actually broke one of the zoning rules, zoning laws of this area. And so what people are most concerned about is that this was a way to kind of break that rule, and now it opens up, um, it, you know, uh, room for private companies to buy land from this um, city park um, and for, for further construction. So once again, that, that um, claims of betonism are actually tapping onto these broader fears about corruption and construction. I'll skip that. So okay, so just to wrap it up, just my where I am right now in terms of kind of the main directions and thoughts that I have with this project. So first, as I mentioned, I, I'm, I look at clearing as a particular practice, a financial practice that is not a capitalist logic of exchange, right? Uh, because of the way that, that people are paying. But at the same time, it actually cohabitates really well with capitalist logics of exchange. So here I'm kind of connecting with 
um, other anthropologists of capitalism that are looking at capitalism as not this monolithic logic, but seeing how different exchange logics kind of intertwine and feed off of each other. Secondly, uh, I, I talked about the redistribution of risk. So um, kind of looking at these different forms of speculation and construction in, in Tirana and other cities in Albania um, makes me think about the, how risk is redistributed, you know, who is getting the short end of the stick, um, and how risk is redistributed both economically but also socially. Um, and, and how do the political and legal systems kind of enable these, these forms of uh, risk. And then finally, um, I, I will continue to look at critiques of betonism and thinking about the local histories and discourses around the materiality of concrete or other materials. Um, and, and what I want to kind of uh, contextualize that within is not just kind of um, uh, global critiques of building and construction, but also how those critiques are connected to this culturally, historically specific imaginaries of European city or Mediterranean city um, and of modernity more generally. So here I am. Any questions? Yeah. So when they're going for a permit, do the people have to show and show proof that they have capital to build this? Or are they just paying people off to say, we're going to forget that step. We, we don't have to look at our finances. Is that how the clearing happens? Um, so, yes. So I think basically it's one of those things that it, it goes case by case. But the idea is that there's some bribing that takes place. If you're not able to show that you have all the uh, capital or means of financing up front, then you're doing something else to get that license. Um, now, on, the, on that said, the interesting thing with clearing is because uh, sometimes some people think of it as like something that's completely informal. It is informal, but it's not completely illegal. So it is recognized as a valid form of payment as long as the two parties have agreed on it. Um, but I don't, I don't know that companies will use that, for instance, like a clearing contract to show that they have financing. I don't think so. So anyway, so that's why usually the, the corruption is higher when you're doing a building by, by clearing, because you don't have to show um, up front. Yeah. Thanks a lot for a fascinating story here. That's, uh, um, let's see. This reminds me of the 2008 that mortgage crisis in mm -hmm. this country. So when we had that construction boom and real estate boom, so we kind of blamed it was just subprime mortgage loan, and so here the clearing. So really, construction booms in let's say office buildings, commercial buildings, right. and residential buildings, all those booms are indeed created by speculation right. and capitalist cities, right? So then when we had the real estate crisis, then we blamed those mortgage lenders and borrowers and all that. But um, the way I see it is that on the the other side of the coin, indeed, those subprime borrowers, or I assume they hear the um, lower middle class people who do not be served by the traditional lending system or mm -hmm. traditional real estate market, they might have been served by this clothing or this corrupted right. system boom, but construction boom does create a large number of housing stocks though. Sure. So when the real estate market goes down, that's good for a lot of people. So that's right. Uh, right. Yeah, and I don't and I don't know for sure like who is has it benefited when the market has gone down. Mm -hmm. um, but I I do I sh I should say, I mean because of that actually those patterns have not been exactly been the same in Albania, right? Because you don't have a lot of, a lot of the financing is not coming from the banks. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, even when there is the cr uh, crisis of liquidity or there, you know, there is like a lot of stock of houses that is not sold, in some way it is absorbed 
um, as a form of social risk, right? It's not, so for better or for worse, it hasn't led to like foreclosure, like a lot of foreclosures like it led here. Um, so in some ways actually clearing has softened that, the crash for, for people, or at least it has softened it for some people and not for others. But, um, so anyway, so I don't know if that, that addresses one of the questions. So, in, it, so, so for that, that's interesting to me because it doesn't follow the typical, uh, you know, boom and bust cycle of a kind of financialized uh, real estate market. One of the things that I heard when I was interviewing a banker in Albania is that uh, apparently a, a lot of Albanians in terms of homeowners, they're very reluctant to take loans. Um, so, so there's not really high loan, there's not an increase in taking like in terms of uh, consumer, consumer loans or, or homeowner loans in the same way that there was here. Um, at the same time, okay, this is like a, a whole other discussion, but at the same time, there, there, for a long time, there wasn't the same kind of credit histories. People don't have credit histories, because they don't have credit. So banks were kind of more lax in terms of giving loans without having collateral or credit. So now, I mean, banks are having a non-performing loan problem. And so that's another thing that the IMF is really pushing the banks to try to, to get that fixed. Um, anyway, but I think, just to go back to that, I think that's why I'm looking at clearing as something that is, it, it, it produces different dynamics. But there's definitely speculation. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any yes. like, labor laws enforcing when these workers will get paid or anything like yeah. that there? Or is there worker rights movements going on? You know, there isn't a workers rights movement, and there should be. Um, there isn't a lot of workers organizing at all. The only, actually, the, the, in the photo that I showed earlier, the, so the protesters here were only youth, um, and they're more like civil society, and they're, they're protesting not necessarily, yeah, they're protesting because it's more ideological. Um, there are, technically, Albania has great laws because it's been, for the last 20 years, it's changed all this legislation to match the European Union standards, so we have great laws. The question is the question of enforcement. <coughs> Um, so, although there is a lot of laws to try to protect workers, in, in reality, um, and, and this is part of the negative consequences of clearing, is that a lot of the contracts are done kind of by verbal agreement, and so it's hard to enforce them if you don't have, like, if it doesn't go through a kind of a formal process. So there's a lot of informality in the labor market, in construction. Now, I should say that's the same here as well, right? So a, a lot of the things, actually, it's interesting that a, as the news is going on here, I'm like, this is like Albania. I mean, a lot of political corruption here also go, is tied to real estate, locally and internationally. So, the, so ironically, in some ways, the story is not so different, right? But anyway, but here too, people working construction work a lot of time under the table, right? So then, um, then it's hard to claim your dues. But those are definitely the people that have been most affected by the clearing crisis in particular. Um, and when, I talk, when, when people talk about the chains of debt, they're not talking just about the monetary debts, but there's also personal debts. Because a lot of times people are drawn into these works with, through friends. Uh, so there, there are these social relations that, are also, that also mediate the debt relations. Um, and so it makes it harder, for instance, for a worker to sue someone who is somehow connected to them, right? Yeah, but that's a great question, yeah. And I said the mayor now is socialist. Is Albania overall a socialist economy or is it capitalist? Well, okay, so it's a great question. It's not a socialist economy at all. It's a, it's a very much, very market economy. Um, Albania adopted the shock therapy reforms without any resistance. Uh, the and the two parties, even though it's called one, it's called socialist, one's called democrat. They're really, sh like I said, they they share very similar economic policies. And and part of it is that and this is a situation that a lot of countries who are post development or post socialist or post colonial find themselves in. Uh, you know, once they get a loan from the IMF, they really have to do whatever the IMF tells them to do. Albania has two 
kind of international bodies that kind of govern it. On one hand, it's the typical you know, IMF World Bank, because that's where we get most of our loans. But the other body is the European Union. Because Albania is trying so hard to get into the European Union, so it will do whatever the European Union says. The European Union also pushes Albania to do more of these policies that are kind of like the structural adjustment policies of reducing government spending um, and privatizing. So that's been kind of the main form. Um, so now the Socialist Party, it's, I mean, if you, they each accuse each other of, you know, the Democratic Party accuses of being communist, but it's not at all, like when you're looking at their policies. They are trying, they try, so this guy, Velia, he, when he was campaigning, he was trying to bring in social issues, um, so he promised, you know, and he has done some, but he, it is still um, kind of trapped into the m main model of the economy of the country. The leader, Adirama, who is the leader, he thinks he's more of like a third way guy. So Tony Blair is one, the, the Tony Blair team is one of his advising team consultants. So, so basically that's kind of, uh, the economic ideology is trying to do that. Yeah. So it's a political party, not, like it doesn't necessarily the economy at all. Um, it's, it, right, so it's a, it's a party that, brands itself as socialist, but the economy is not socialist by any means. I mean, there is still a lot, like what's happening right now, actually the Socialist Party is at a boom because it has central government. It won on a landslide this summer. Up until last year, it was coalition government. Um, but this time, it's like the first time in a while that one party got it all, right? They don't, they don't need to be in a coalition government. And still, all the reforms going forward have to do with trying to find these, the, you know, one of the reforms that he, one of the things that I very recently was reading about that Erdogan Belia is proposing is to create these free economic zones. Now, that's a very neoliberal, that's not a socialist policy. I mean, o on the other hand, I mean, we see other socialist countries that are doing the same thing. It's very much like China style. Um, creating a free zone, which means creating a zone where, there want, where all these rules about labor, laws or uh, whatever will be suspended and it's all you know to attract foreign companies to come and basically establish sweatshops in Albania so it's it's really um, and I think part of it is because the pressure because you know countries like Albania don't have um, they're not independent in their political system they are dependent on these international uh, governing structures. Yeah. If people aren't getting paid for like work, then how do they pay bills or pay for other things? Like, where are they getting money from? So one explanation that's first of all, there is a growing inequality. So that was one of the latest statistics shows that there was growing inequality. Speaking of wealth and poverty, and some of the you know in the map of Tirana that I showed earlier, of course, um, a lot of the you know, it's like this is a map that shows population growth, but you could use the same color scheme to also show um, income inequality, because most of the most of the poor uh, population is um, settled in the outskirts. But but on the other hand, in terms of source of income, uh, Albania relies also greatly on remittances, and that has been a source of financial aid support for the country's poorest. Uh, throughout the transition. And that is something that, so a lot of the time, so when I was talking to the people from the bank, um, they were saying that, you know, because they want to get people to get loans, right? And I'm like, no, that's a good thing that they're not getting a loan, you know, if they don't have money. Um, and I think part of it is that, again, people are, don't want to have to be tied to this interest through the bank, so they've, they've been um, relying mostly on remittances. And the other thing that people do um, a lot, uh, pretty much every store, even in the center of Tirana, this is not a peripheral thing, every grocery store has a list where people are ba buying things by a list and basically they don't have cash but they're promised that they're going to pay later. So that's been going on for a while too. So people are kind of, again, buying on credit for the future uh, but without interest. I have yeah. a question about like the culture of home ownership. Because mm -hmm. right? as you said, 
you said, when this when it was a communist regime, uh, housing was provided by the state, so people have their homes, but right, they might have a different relationship to the sense of owning their homes. Yeah. And how does that change when that um, when you right move to um, a capitalist system? And then and then what you what you're saying about uh, people being resistant to getting uh, mortgages? It seems. Right, very something that's also common in Brazil. That's very common in other yeah. parts of Europe. Right, it's very much an American thing. This idea that, right, you grow up, you get a job, you take a mortgage. Mom, right. Yeah. So, so how is that changing in Albania, Albania? Like the culture of, you know, is that a, that's an adult step to do? People should want to buy their mm -hmm. own home, their own apartment. Uh, is there is there also like a, a, a a cultural, right, a cultural movement yeah, yeah, yeah. that is trying to change people's minds or people are changing their minds. So um, that, that's a great question and I've, I've explored this a little bit in my book, my earlier book which was on the pyramid schemes because a lot of people, um, so when, in, after the 90s what happened is that every, there was this law of privatization that basically everyone who lived in an apartment which was technically not theirs, it was the states, they could privatize it. So then pe people quickly became owners of an apartment, of one of those you know, socialist drab concrete apartments. Um, this is actually it's one of the best buildings. It has this cool design over here. <laughs> but, um, but then people quickly wanted to sell those apartments. So a lot of them like, sold them, put the cash into the pyramid schemes, and then they wanted to triple the amount of money in three months so they could buy a bigger apartment, a newer apartment. So there was definitely this urge for home ownership um, that, that's been there, and, and it has to do with a kind of a reaction against the extreme ban on private ownership during communism, I think. And also, of course, the influence of media, of kind of the idea of like owning, a, uh, not only like owning a home, like an apartment, but all owning a villa, right? That's considered as like the, uh, something to aspire to. Um, so, so, and, and I, so when I was going back and doing research, doing my dissertation work, I was living in New York in an apartment, I didn't even think about owning, and I was really shocked that everyone considered renting as like, in Albania, as like r being stranded in the streets. Mm -hmm. So there is a sense of um, uh, well-being that is attached to home ownership. At the same time, it's it, weird because at the same time there's also this real fear of uh, debt and paying interest to the bank because people were not ever used to pay interest on anything even when they had they could take l small loans from the bank in Albania but the interest rates were like 1% 2% you know so this idea of paying interest to the bank was is very foreign so then people try to try to get their houses in by you know paying all in cash or other ways of financing a lot of people actually build their own houses in rural areas or in the periphery um, but there's definitely been a consistent desire to have uh, home ownership. There's definitely, um, it's not necessarily attached to adulthood, it's definitely uh, expectation of when you get married, you, you want a new home. Mm -hmm. So that's what came out, a lot of my friends who are like young couples that were saying that there's this pressure on them to like, you get married, you get a house, like an, uh, an apartment, right? right? But a home. Um, a privately owned home. So that is definitely a cultural thing that's become more and more entrenched. Um, I think that the attitudes towards credit are changing, especially with the younger generation. I think younger generation uh, kids are having now access to credit cards. So I think that's going to change their relationship to credit mm -hmm. in some way. But I don't think people are over going over in debt mm -hmm. in terms of in relation to home. The other thing that I noticed this summer that I was shocked about is this is not relating to homes, uh, but to credit in general, people going more in debt in terms of businesses. Um, but going in debt, not with banks, but with loan sharks and money lenders. So that's also going on. But there's definitely a distrust towards the <coughs> bank. But yeah, but to go back to the house, I think the, 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 the love of the house was A, a reaction towards communism, and B, there's definitely been this influence, like cultural influences from Italian TV, from people migrating and coming back, uh, of the desire to buy homes. A lot of the migrants who go to Greece and Italy, even if they're, they go there for good, 
uh, they invested in building a home back home. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing, and it's part of, it's just to have it. Like it's not really being used. Maybe they come for a holiday. It's not being used, it's not being rented. It's, it's, not, it's, it's more like a sort of status mm -hmm. um, wealth rather than wealth for producing more wealth. Mm -hmm. So that's another important kind of cultural trend. Mm -hmm. How are we doing? One more minute. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, guys.